So scaling in and out of trades, I'll, I'll discuss that. But okay, so let's knock out the easy ones first. So correlations and you know, I'm, I'm a, personally as a trader, a lot of us here at Axia, uh, all of us use correlations in some way or another, uh, depending how you look at things. I myself use correlations a lot. I, everything on the price ladder, anything in order flow related for me, really, really clicked uh, when I looked at correlations and um, you know, understanding how they interweave on a sort of the, the macro basis. So there is one, uh, in, I don't want to, again, um, go into too much detail just for the stream, just because here, if I, for those guys who, I know we have our regular faces here, so you guys have probably seen this, okay? But if you haven't, uh, in these two, in these two uh, streams I did earlier, uh, we have the highlights from, from before where, you know, I talked a lot about uh, sort of easier like risk on, risk off, hawkish, dovish kind of order flow and the correlations that show up in the, in the, in the section. So if you guys haven't seen that, check that out first. Okay, and um, check that out first and, uh, you know, uh, watch that out first and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. But just to answer the, something uh, Chris answered here, interestingly, about, you know, having trouble spotting them, um, you know, as he believes correlations are always constant. So this is the first thing I wanted to talk about where, um, I was talking to someone, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, on our group, on our trading group, and uh, you know, one of the other floor traders here, and uh, it's kind of like the way we described it. I believe was that the correlations come and go, and they're not always constant. And this is where it's very useful to have a sort of a log of you understanding of debriefing how these correlations come and go. But it's sort of like, uh, oh, I'm I'm very tempted, guys. Okay, I'm very very tempted. Sorry. Okay, let me let me just whip out the, uh, the 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 thing here. Let's see how it works. Okay, so let me just uh, I have this, so I have to use it now. Okay, so basically, imagine you've got this is probably gonna fall uh, flat on his face, but anyway, here we go. So imagine you have the solar system, that's the sun, and then you have uh, okay, let, let's not say that's the sun, our solar system. Let's just make it up. It's a solar system, and then you have the various. Uh, planets or whatever else orbits in the solar system, comets and everything. Um, and the way the markets work in this sense is that what you usually have is that these themes, um, these themes in the market from a macro perspective, they come and go and the market sort of tears. It sort of, I just want to avoid the chat here. Let's see. So here we, no, it's too far. So I'll draw it up here. So basically the market can only focus like, you know, on one, on, on one thing, second thing, zoomed in there a bit second thing third thing and so on it's sort of like a shelf where it can only really focus you know it's got to say okay guys you know first we, first of all we have to reprice we have to discount the information we're getting right now from the new sources to then reprice our assets based on the information we're getting and then it deals with item number one and then it deals with item number two and then it deals with item number three not always but you usually see like there's these diff different kind of themes these different um the way the market just pays attention to one thing or another like for example on one day uh, this is going back a few you know back in january or end of last year you could tell how the treasury market the u.s treasuries the u.s bonds were very concerned about you know the incoming uh, spending and, and and the budget requirements to uh that'll be needed in the u.s and you can tell that you know for like tuesday and wednesday they cared about it then we repriced we came off and then friday was about a different kind of order flow a different kind of uh, correlations that were being played out okay so if you misunderstand the theme that is being played out by the market based on you know risk on risk off hawkish dovish flow um flow that discounts let's say that's or, or for example what we've been seeing really very recently is as bonds have been let me keep using my uh, pad here as bond futures prices have been going down bond yields have been going up and there's this general sense that we're getting more scared of bond yields going up and then the equity prices go down so what you, you what you what you saw was uh bond futures and bond equities were actually going down together rather than risk on and off flow where you know equities may go, uh may go uh okay seems we got uh, this this pen does want to play ball all the time anyway let's um let's go here so compared to risk on where equities may bid you know they get bought and the bonds sell off and, and you can tell the way the flows sort of come in and out of, you know, in and out of on, on a theme basis of how they, you know, the market discounts that. Okay, it's done. Okay, let's let's go to the next item. And then you have this sort of this ticking off kind of, um, you know, the, the checklist. And then what you want to imagine is that this theme, this, this um, 
you know, becomes the center of gravity for all other markets. And this is where, for example, uh, all, all market correlations, when there's, there's very, very strong uh, flow and there's a very strong theme, all market correlations be basically become one, 100%, or, you know, uh, highly, extremely highly correlated or as, as, as much as correlated as possible. So sort of this is why I drew this sort of weird uh, solar system uh, for you to sort of remember, is that the gravitational pull of the most important thing becomes so, so, um, so uh, overwhelming that all, everything that's orbiting, every single market, every single asset class that is orbiting that theme, you know, whether it's currencies, commodities, equities, bonds, uh, currencies in a continent away or whatever, they all start moving in tandem. They all dance to the same tune because the gravitational pull of that, of that theme is so dramatic, it's so overwhelming that uh, they dance to it. And that's an extreme. Okay, so, but most of the time when you come in on most days, this gravitational pull sort of waxes and wanes and it's kind of up to you through experience and through debriefing and journaling and you know figuring it out that this gravitational pull sort of on some days you may you may see you know you may see the bonds uh trickling up trickling down whatever the equities trickling down trickling up and whatever and they're, they're kind of doing their own thing so it's kind of like the gravitational pull of that of that big body is sort of is so weak that you know this uh you know this let's say the bonds go off and do their own thing the equities start doing their own thing and the currencies start doing their own thing. And because there's no central theme, it's very difficult then to say, you know, oh, I'm looking at this asset class and therefore that correlation is now happening. So uh, maybe you didn't mean that question in that way, Chris, but uh, sort of like always looking at correlations in that way, it's a sort of bit uh, misleading just because you, you're sort of looking at it in too fine detail. Like it's, um, it's kind of like when you see it, you'll know it. You don't really have to second guess. Is there a strong correlation here or not? Obviously, you might have it between very, always very highly, uh, you know, uh, related, like, you know, let's say you're trading the curve in the bonds or in the oil curve or something, but that's kind of, you know, besides going away from what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and I see here, Chris, uh, so would you say a good grasp, grasp of economic topics is required or at least helps to find the correlations? It's not so much that you have to have a good uh, grasp to find them. Uh, but it's sort of like a lot of the themes that will develop will be macroeconomic in nature. And for you to really be comfortable in digesting everything that you're hearing and therefore giving weight to this, to this, um, to this theme, you have to understand, you have to have a good understanding. I mean, we're not talking like PhD level or like, you know, some crazy university level understanding. And in fact, a lot of the time, if you really look at any of that material, it's going to be, it's just going to lead you down the wrong path because you, just, you know, it's, it's not as relevant. But the key thing you want to do is being very good at assessing how good is this uh, gravitational pull of X, Y, and Z theme today in making all other, you know, all other planetary body bodies, all other asset classes, all other planets uh, in relation to it. Okay, but again, remember, most of the time that will actually be, you know, they're doing their own random thing. Uh, so uh, um, that, that's sort of my little uh, five minute take on it. So if I now just minimize this and return, so that's sort of like, you know, Chris, uh, as I believe they're always constant. So, you know, so they, they wax and wane, and I believe hopefully that'll be a good metaphor uh, to address correlations. And as I said, you know, for those who haven't seen it, uh, you can go through some basic stuff here. But don't worry, I'm a big fan of talking at, at, at length about correlations and everything. So hopefully I'm going to extend that into a bigger stream uh, later on, and hopefully I can get you some more material like price ladder and everything. Okay, so uh, that, that one I hope to spend a few minutes on. And let's knock out this one quickly as well, because it's kind of interrelated. So Flo, your question about which events are important on the economic calendar, and uh, are you looking at all data which is coming out? And this will actually relate to something down here, and I'll kind of touch upon it in, now. So anytime, anywhere you are, pretty much any tier one economic data, and what do I mean by tier one? Uh, the kind of data that you know that the federal, okay, not the federal, the, any central bank will be using to make its uh, policy decisions in the future. Uh, so obviously the crux of that is in terms of the FOMC in the US, it is the inflation, you know, the CPI prints, the inflation numbers, and, uh, you know, various employment uh, economic data <clears throat> like NFP, but not include, you know, not just that. And then, you know, by, by implication, that also makes uh, GDP, um, GDP uh, uh, data and so on, uh, 
important because it gives you a lead perspective on you know what's happening in the economy to infer employment and inflation and you know that goes into the big box of sort of the macroeconomic thinking so anything in in, in that kind of sense where your 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 understanding your understanding you know the, the pure like top-down heavy uh economic data you will always prepare for always be ready you, you you're constantly debriefing journaling it uh, no matter how the data comes out, even if markets do not care about it, you know, the data comes out, bang, you're looking up and down, oh, and market doesn't care, cool. But you are going to debrief that. Do not miss out on that. However, if we dig a bit deeper in understanding which events are more important, uh, it, it's, it's understanding where we are in the uh, sort of the, 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 the central bank hiking or cutting interest rates cycle. Okay, not just that, there's other implications because... Um, you know, for example, we saw this, uh, this is a very good example where it's sort of understanding what the market's looking at for lead information on what the central banks will do. And I believe at one point during the pandemic last year, I think around summer, there's a lot of talk uh, on a lot of, um, uh, you know, research pieces, or even I think some central banks were looking at what they would call high frequency data, as in the kind of data they can get from credit card companies to figure out how spending will look like, you know, in the months or two months from now. And, I, and if I remember distinctly, we were starting to move pricing, like the markets were starting to move on some of those data releases. And you're thinking, wow, those data releases, they're so niche, they're so nuanced. Who the hell cares about those data releases? Well, 99% of the time, no one cares. But the fact that that just beca that became relevant logically based on what's happening in real time in the markets has become relevant. For example, um, anything in the US that had to do with um, a new home buying, uh, home uh, remortgaging or, or home repurposing, uh, delinquency rates, I think, uh, obviously in 2008, 2009, 2010, that became a very, very big uh, economic data to watch. And you can ask anyone who is trading in that time that the markets were moving off of it. At, when we came out of that crisis, especially you know, in the more like uh, Western uh, hemisphere, um, no one even cares. Like no one, the market will not even look at it twice. Like even if it's some out of line number, the market will just not move on it. So it's being very aware over over how these events fit in with um, you know what's what, what's logically being talked about in the market. Okay, and this is kind of to answer these guys down here. For example, you know how does the market regime change and how do you adapt? What steps do you look for? when you create a playbook and so on. And I'll come back to this at the end of the stream, but it's it's understanding. Uh, okay, let me, attempt number two, let's, uh, I could probably go on one of the economic data uh, charts right now, but it's fine, well, I'll, I'll just draw it out. If you look at basically how 2008 was, I think they basically, the, the, the Federal Reserve, we had an initial, I think, cut, and then I think a really big cut that took us down to nearly zero. And then basically we looked, we we went like this, oversimplifying it. And then, you know, the Fed was trying to go through periods where they're trying to normalize, normalize rates, normalize as in bring them back to what was back then seen as normal rates, like, you know, several, you know, three, four, five percent or whatever, uh, depending how far back in time you go. And then they're trying to normalize rates. But one thing you'll always notice with central banks is that they'll never hike like this. They'll never say, hey, guys, uh, we're going to hike, uh, I don't know, two percent, right? They're going to do it extremely, extremely like, I don't know, like uh, as, as little basis points as possible, right? So they're going to tiptoe, they're going to staircase like this in terms of hiking and being very, very gentle with the market in feeding in and in, in feeding in these hikes. OK, and what you'll notice is that the market environment is extremely, extremely different when we're in this regime, extremely different in this regime and extremely different in this regime and the economic data that's important in each three of these regimes as in holding rates cutting rates um, as in uh, I think you can't actually see my mouse in holding rates here cutting rates and then normalizing or hiking rates you're, you're looking at very different things you know for example so let's say in in, in this example and this is kind of like the ECB in, in Europe uh, their conundrum is the fact that if they're looking at purely inflation as the metric to base their interest rates on um, you know, uh, they can, they can only, and it, this is, this is jumping the gun guys, but so I'm going to assume, you know, a bit of central bank knowledge here, but, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you in a later stream where, because they, because, uh, for them interest, uh, controlling the interest rate is, is, is the only real tool they can use in their mind to control inflation. 
the general like the general idea is that if inflation starts to creep up and starts to increase, that gives you room to now start increasing interest rates, or you may have to actually be forced to increase interest rates. Hopefully that won't happen, but it, it can do, and depending what economy you're in. And so, uh, in reverse, if they start hiking interest rates by a decent amount, then inflation starts to. So if we, if I draw. So then you may have inflation, you know, uh, let's say inflation is slowly, slowly picking up here. And then the central banks will say, hey, look, uh, inflation is starting to pick up. This is great. Uh, there's more that goes into this, into this, guys. I'm oversimplifying. But let's just say this. You know, guys, look, now we have room to maneuver. We have room to maneuver. What does that mean? We have to increase. So then they start increasing and they start increasing. And there's a general lag time. But often enough, uh, interest rate increases, the inflation will start to taper off and the last thing they want to do is do this that's really bad okay and uh, and and at one point this this um <clears throat> i'll draw it in blue this hiking cycle or this normalization will have to finish they'll either you know taper it and maintain uh, for longer and that's that's really important when the inflation metrics become extremely important in understanding uh you know will the fed because the market always overprices how many times the fed as a general rule it will always overprice how many hikes they will do i think in 2019 the, the market the the interest rate curve was pricing three interest rate hikes and i think we got like well i can't remember what it was now i think like three or four and we got obviously uh, hardly any of that because it, it was overpricing that and generally when the market realizes it's overpriced this based on data it's when you have the ridiculous 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 news okay the ridiculous flows like you know the big flows in the bonds in the, in the, in the markets when the correlations come in and then and then uh yeah you know that's that's when you make that's when you make the the sun is shining as an intraday trader and, and you make hay while you can okay so <clears throat> uh that's sort of to answer this fundamentals on bond guys on, on bonds i would love to uh really really dig into it i'm i i, I love talking about this kind of thing this is literally going to be an entire like probably several worth of streams. Um, and in fact, one thing I will sort of hint is that uh, what I noticed sometimes with some of the new guys coming in, there's still a lot of demand uh, for the new traders that actually you know, to come in and, and really sink their teeth into um, bond stuff, bond rates and central banks and stuff. Obviously, you know, you learn it by being on the floor and you learn it by osmosis and something. And we often tell the guys, hey, you've got to go off and figure out what the yield curve is. And they usually use their own initiative to find out as you should. But I feel like there's also a good opportunity for, uh, you know, for Axie to put together their own little internal handbook, uh, you know, for this, doing this. And perhaps later down the line, maybe in a year's time, we, we can talk about sort of getting you guys in on this, on this, um, the, this sort of bond and rates handbook as a little pet project. But that's, uh, that's neither here nor there, but that's just, um, you know, responding to John, uh, John B and Hyten or Hinton, sorry if I mispronounced uh, there. Anyway. But that's that's a little take on that. And uh, anyway, let's get back to this sort of this big granddaddy here of uh, scaling in and out of trades. I know there was a f quite a lot of demand on this guys last time. So uh, I want to sort of uh, talk about this topic now at the beginning. Let's spend a good five, 10 minutes talking about the uh, talking about this a bit more philosophically. And and just as I go into that, actually, let me bring up two things. So if you guys want to also, I mean, this, this, this video came out a while ago, but it's, it's really, really good. Um, we, we've got Adam here who does a lot of the debriefs of, I think uh, you can just see his face. He does a lot of the debriefs from one of our lead traders, uh, them who, you know, who, who, who trades a lot of, you know, you've seen his ladders, um, you know, uh, him hitting size and, you know, trades a lot of correlation and flow. And he's done a video here and you should really look it up, uh, four steps to execute like a actual lead trader. And he talks exactly how he breaks down like the process of how you know you would scale in and out so if you want to go really really like minute to detail uh you can see here but the crux of it is is uh you know this is more optimized of course for trading more like you know fast flows based on news so it will differ based on what you're trading if you're trading more like you know like swing style or like let's say you're more scalpy or whatever but let, let's just talk about generically you know always a good idea in the size in with size quickly out with small clips that's his style uh never hold full size offside i'll go into this a lot you aim to stay with the trade until exhaustion and so on and that's that's a bit of a, a special one but anyway so if you guys want to look more about um yeah using brave brave browser there <laughs> um 
yeah, so really look into this video. It's really good. Anyway, the, the reason I want to bring this up is something here called never hold full size offside. And that really brings me to a, the bit of a, a bit of the philosophical side where let me just clear, clear this canvas. Okay, so where is my okay, so basically, fundamentally, the problem you will have always with all markets, no matter which one you trade, even even uh, non financial markets, or like, you know, you go to a in car market, secondhand cars, um, uh, fruits, whatever, anyway, it doesn't matter, um, you know, away from your screens, you'll always have the problem of something called adverse ad verse selection okay so uh you, you guys may have uh, heard about this adverse selection but it's a really 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 big problem which i feel like really doesn't get talked about that much i've you know i've heard people talking about it and it's really good but it's really good to just nail it down and understand what it is okay so adverse selection is literally when you want it, as in you want the trade, it's hard to get it or you can't get it. When you don't want it or you, or you get the trade too easily, you probably do not want it. Okay. So that might be weird when I might tell you, but it actually makes quite complete sense. And think about it this way. It's my personal opinion, but I think it really, you know, it, it echoes a lot of, um, it, it, it echoes a lot of, not that people will call it this way, but every kind of trader will tell you literally this, but under different kind of themes or, you know, understanding or whatever. That, um, that um, you'll, always, you'll always be in the market. You'll never know the true reason. You'll never know 100%, like you'll never know mathematically, like the way you can figure out everything there is to know. You'll never know the true reason 100% why you're on side, why your position is on side. And you'll never truly, truly know 100% why you are offside. But generally, the markets being, you know, fairly efficient and fairly good at what they're doing, you have to, have to, have to, through rudimentary survival, assume that the reason you're offside, there's probably a good reason. You might, you don't know yet. You might find out later, and and you'll never know, perhaps. And if you're onside, there is probably a very good reason for that, also. Therefore, as exactly as John B just said a bit like a partial fill exactly because if you're let's say and this is why sometimes when you know let's say the market's moving like crazy and, you, and you're trying to go for a breakout or there's some news and you're trying to buy it as it keeps bidding up and up and you're trying to hit it and you get slipped or like it gives you a partial fill or whatever it, it's bad it's i'm not saying it's a good thing but in a way you can you can understand that it's perhaps a good thing because if there's such a crazy let's um let me move this down if there's a crazy like you know the market's just skipping and skipping and skipping prices and it, it behaves in that manner, then for you to get, even get filled, you know, at this price, this price, this price, this price, it's good because you, you, you may not understand 100% why you keep getting on side. I mean, you should understand because that's why you're in the trade, but you'll never truly, truly know. And I, and I want to discuss that finer point in a bit. Um, so, you know, if you find the price is like ridiculously skipping, keeps going, keeps going, that's when you should be perhaps more aggressive in scaling in because usually you'll probably, that, that's happening for a good reason. Okay, you'll never know why, but it's happening for a good reason. And you, you, it's like you have to fight. You have to fight to get it. Like you have to keep paying up. The market will force you to pay. The market will force you to pay more premium, like higher and higher and higher in prices to get this kind of, uh, you know, rush of orders. Okay. Um, likewise, if you trade for example a very thick market okay uh and you and you are um you know you, let's say you put your limit here and the market fills you pretty easily okay so let's say at the, let's say you you put your order at the inside bid and let's say the the, the inside bid is like 2345 okay if the market literally uh, trades into you and trades like t uh, 10, uh, I don't know, uh, let, uh, let's make it up 50 lots, and you're instantly filled at the back of the queue. So you join the back of the queue. Remember, guys, you, this is a first in, first out market. So let's say the, the markets bid this, and then with your little two lot, you put in uh, two, like two lots, you, then this, then this, um, then this um, price will then change from a five to a seven because you just put your little two lot there. Okay. 
And if you notice, obviously, because you're at the back of the queue, the market has to eat through all those 2,300 contracts, okay? It fills you very easily. That is not always a good sign, okay? And, and, and that, what I just said there, is very nuanced. It's so, like, you, we can debate this endlessly forever, and, and I don't really want to start that discussion right now. But the point is, is that notice the big difference in the, the extremes where you're fighting for price, and as long as that continues, that's probably a good sign. And if you get very filled very easily, or you know, if you if the market's trading here and you put in a limit here and it just goes like like that, I, okay, but saying it's not a good sign is very generic. And I, and, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move slightly more philosophically away from that and just say that this brings me to the next thing, which is understanding of do you want to be um, scaling in as you are on site, or do you want to, uh, I don't wanna use the phrase average in, but do you want to add as you're going off site? Okay, so let's say. If I move down here, um, you know, so let's say you're, you're filled in here. Obviously, there's so many frequent strategies, uh, you know, good or bad, where you're, you're offside and, you, you know, you add in, you know, a few limits there, a few, a few, a few, a few, and you bring down your average price. Okay, cool. The problem is, conversely, if you're on site, let's say, you, you know, you're bid up here, let's say you put in some of your size here. And then you keep, you know, you keep buying, 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 and then your average price is actually worse because you drag your average price from here, you drag it up, okay? Whereas you could say, okay, cool, well, I'm getting filled offside, but I'm getting a better and better average price. But this is the problem. That probably holds very true for markets which are like, you know, let's say when you're spreading markets or when you're trading, you know, when you're trading outright futures specifically, this, uh, and trust me, look, I suffered from this kind of problem, you know, right from when I was beginning because when I, you know, when really when I started to trade, I was really big on, you know, on fading, on, on, on getting filled like this, you know, you, you scatter your orders and so on. And, and I'm not saying that's, you know, 100% wrong all the time or whatever. We're a bit more nuanced. I'm just saying you have to understand the, the, of what the, the thing you're trying to capture here, because when you're trading outright futures, you have to assume that the reason you're kind of getting filled so easily on all of your orders is probably for a good reason. Okay. There's probably a good reason you're getting filled on all of your orders. And remember, the definition of adverse selection is that you'll always, always get filled on the on the trades you do not want. And you will never get filled on as much size as you want on the trades that you do want, as in your profitable trades. And this is where it creates this conundrum where you'll always get filled maximum size here on all of your losers, on all of your losing trades. And you'll never theoretically, unless you executed like, you know, full size instant, uh, you'll, you'll never always have as much size when you try and uh, you know chase the market because let's say the momentum is, or the volatility really picks up and just keeps going okay far beyond what you might expect and this is why you you may not always you know be hitting you know full size to get in and this is where it creates this gigantic skew in your risk profile okay because again you you are you're not taking as much as you know the, the trace that you do want you're not getting much out of them and you're taking much bigger hits on here and let me tell you guys no matter how much you try and get around this problem, at least from trading outright futures, when you think about it, that's a really big problem. Again, I'm not saying 100% that that is perhaps the wrong strategy. It's for you to decide exactly how to apply it. But be 100. Your if you're if you're if you're doing this while you're scaling offside, your entire entire focus is thinking, how in the world do I remove? Or you'll never remove this problem ever. But how do I alleviate this problem? This is your huge conundrum. Okay. And how do I alleviate this problem? And that, and that should be your core focus. And, th and that's really the, the philosophical sidetrack I wanted to go on, which is when you why do we scale in, how we scale in, and why do we scale out when we scale out? Okay, so for, for a lot of guys, I mean, again, I can't speak for every single trader we have at Axio, but for a lot of them, uh, and, and, and again, you know, for a lot of the Axio guys, uh, you know, you see them as, uh, let me see, <clears throat> If I can just maximize, perfect. So if you see here, okay. So see if you can see uh, the ladder. Main, okay, let me uh, let me screenshot this. Perhaps let's see if this is gonna work. Bit of quick uh, quick hands here. Okay, it actually worked. Some somewhat. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, to those asking, will the stream be posted later? Yes, so we'll have this 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 full stream up, guys, on uh, for a week, a week roughly, and then we'll take down the stream uh, and we'll leave on just the highlights. 
And then for those who want to watch the full stream, it'll always be available for the Axia uh, live streaming members, the ones, you know, for the premium streaming uh, site. So you, you'll always have, you know, forever access to those. Okay, so this is why everyone is very big on understanding that if, let's say, there's big momentum, big shift in volatility, and it's directional for a reason, you want to you wanna, uh, play the game where if you're, all, let's say, okay, so I think in this example, he was getting short. So let's just stick to that example. So this is the entry price. You hit short, and you 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 understand you're playing that game while you're you're on side. You're the market's moving favorably to you. You're either trying to add in as much as possible without shifting your average price uh, this favorably, and then trying to be extremely extremely light on your feet when you are on offside. And let me tell you guys, the amount of time, like literally. You know, thinking back to when I first started, especially, you know, from the retail side and then, you know, trying to figure it out for so many years for myself. This thing, when, when I finally internalized this, it made me feel like the most stupid, like, you know, person on the planet. When someone tells you, hey, literally, why are you, you whenever you're on a losing trade, you, you get filled with a lot of orders. When you take out, when you, when you, when you're, when, you, when you're on site, you don't really scale in. Why is that? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I, da, da. And I was making excuses. Why? Because a lot of the time it is psychologically easier to just wait there and get passively filled rather than to be aggressive and really scale in and really scale in. But remember, most of the time, the reason if you're getting in justified, you're getting into, into the market for justified reasons, okay, you should be doing the exact opposite. You should be extremely light or maybe not even in a, in a, in a position or extremely light on your feet when you're offside. And when you're onside, your entire focus should be to just you know, you got to be like a dog. You, you just got to keep that bone, you, you know, you, got, you just got to like, and not let go. Like you just got to stick with the trade as much as possible, be putting in as much size as possible. And this is the thing. When I was, uh, you know, when I was, I was always very happy to take the pain. This is the ironic reason. I was always very happy to just go off site and get filled, you know, filled on some limits here, filled, 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 filled. And, you know, I, I could tell, you know, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm minus, uh, I don't know, let's make up a number, minus, um, 300 minus 600 minus 800 minus 1000 minus 1000. I was like, yeah, cool. You know, it's fine. It's fine. It's in the strategy. You know, I've, oh, yeah, I've prepped, uh, you know, psychology all good. No, I feel good about this. And you're sitting there and you go more and more and more offside. So I was thinking to myself, if I'm willing to be, let's say what I was thinking, you know, uh, mentally more strong to take the pain stupidly, then why am I so scared when I'm actually on site? The market's telling me I'm on site for a reason. The exact opposite was happening. You know, I was in with a few lots and I was like, uh, I've got a good price. I don't wanna, I don't want to drag my average price down. And uh, okay, okay. And the market was keep going, going, going. And I was like, well, literally, if I just added into that, you know, you'd have taken a huge heap out of it. But then I and then it hit me. Why didn't I use all of my, let's say, my my patience or my ability to take this pain here going off side and flip it around? Be extremely unwilling, extremely unwilling to just take any heat whatsoever with any size offside and be greedy as hell to push your opportunity and really, really, really go for it. Go for the jugular um, when you're onside. And remember, this is, again, bringing me back to, this is why I wanted to start this, this, this part with, okay, adverse selection. Okay. And, guys... Any video you'd watch here, uh, hopefully we can get more of more of the stream. I mean, okay, so perhaps there's some guys who um, you know may. I'm sure all of you have seen have has seen you know Dem's uh, ladders uh, here. There's a huge playlist of something called Axia Lead Trader. If you go on the YouTube channel of him trading so many different trades, whatever, and you'll see this characteristic of him. But he is one of the many traders, and I'll tell you if everything links all of these traders together, is the fact that the ones is that they have this ridiculous ability to shift from if they're offside. Let me uh, actually let's just make some more space here. They have this ridiculously good ability that if they're offside, they're either uh, not in the trade or so 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 light, so tiny, like literally tiny size in the offside. And then when the market starts tilting in their favor, they'll go you know scale scale and scale in, and then they'll just go bang and they'll absolutely unleash they'll pull out all the stops go for the jugular and then uh you know take take what's take what's uh coming in you know and, and they take as much juice out of that trade okay 
and that really that it sounds so simple when I tell it to you guys, and you're like, well, if it's that simple, surely this is obvious. But literally, until someone tells you this, literally in your face, you know, you come up with like, oh yeah, but you know, I've got the strategy of you know, fading, and then you scale in. But honestly, okay, perhaps you know that that is a very valid strategy. But it's so easy as a new trader to conflate what is psychologically easy to add in while you're offside and psychologically hard to add in while you're on site to screw up a winning trade, which is exactly, you should be exactly the opposite. You know, when, when, when you're off site, you have to assume when you're off site that there is a good reason for it and you're on site for a very good reason. Disregarding whatever, even if you're scalping, if you're trading a news comment, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're you know, on the swing, whatever, it's always, it's always this case. Okay. Um, and, and again, diverging, the reason why I truly, truly believe this, and again, uh, I'm showing you like, uh, guys a lot of things. I think I brought this up last stream, and, I, and, and hopefully we'll have a nice... Okay, I've just lost the, uh, uh, the little thingy. I'll put this in the link, guys. Uh, I have written this myself, of course, but <laughs> I'm plugging my own, my own little blog. But have a read because uh, I, mean, I I could talk about this for ages. But uh, have a read. I'll put it. I'll put this in the link. The, what, uh, this kind of talks about footprints and everything. But the reason I want to talk about is is the fact that where is it? Where is it? Trading is something in what we call the complexity domain. Okay, trading is not complicated. Okay, trading resides in the complex domain. As in the information, you'll, you're, you're always operating under opaque information. This is what I meant by you'll never truly 100% the reason why you're on side. You'll never truly 100% understand the reason you're off side. You'll just never know. There's just too many variables, too, mu too much information. There's too much complexity happening. But that doesn't mean trading is complicated. It just means that the way you have to deal with uncertainty and probabilities and so on, you just have to take certain assumptions for granted as in adverse selection and that should underpin a lot of a lot of your if you under, if you really truly digest adverse selection then that should make a lot of sense to why you should scale in now not scale in or uh, scale out of trades uh, so that's kind of a long long-winded way but uh yeah if, if you guys read that and and perhaps I'll, I'll really love to you know bring in a few guys to talk about this because it, it, it's something i really i think is very applicable but uh anyway so that's um so, so that's kind of the gist so if I go back to some of the questions, which uh, the ones in the Excel, I believe. Okay, here we go. Do you guys see this? Yes, you do. Uh, Captain Axelrod, thank you for giving your time and uh, liking the stream. Uh, anyway, so where are we on our guys? Okay, so. How do I scale in the best way, best out possible? A risk control scaling in and out of trades. So kind of, I gave a very philosophical approach, but the kind of, the reason why I did this guys is because if you, if you understand like first principles, like the building blocks for understanding the logic of how we as traders at Axia execute, like the core nuance, then everything I will be explaining on top should make perfect sense. Like not that you will figure it out by yourself, but if you, if, you understand, if you really truly understand adverse selection and the reason why you execute that way, then it, it, you going from A to B to C of, of, of thinking through it should be a lot easier, if that makes sense, if, if you have that underpinning. Um, and again, now we're going to talk a bit more about tactics, of course. So, uh, you know, uh, and in uh, general chat questions, uh, yeah, 100%. And I think you guys are also very aware of this. And I'll, and I'll do questions in a second, guys, so don't worry. Uh, is, if you're trading the S&P, SPU, ES, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's always someone who asks why SPU, but uh, the S&P. If you're trading the S&P, if you're trading NASDAQ, if you're trading oil, if you're trading thicker markets, if you're trading the bonds, even if they're not as, perhaps of you know various liquidity and so on, uh, you know, thickness, thinness, whatever, different volatility profiles, you have to be aware of how it moves. That's just a pure tactic of knowing your product, okay? And yes, there, there is various circumstances where you can be a bit more, you know, faster to take out little little clips. So, for example, again, you know, from the from the stream, uh, you know, to execute, the, you know, in this trader here, he, uh, you know, he let's say he's short a hundred lot, and he's taking out, you know, ones, one lots, like one, 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 one. Okay. In another stream, 
if I've got it, I think it was actually the same one I showed you. The we have one of our senior trader senior traders, uh, Andy, of him trading the the U.S. selection, the order flow in that uh, you know in November. You can see that you know he 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 would get in and then proactively as he would depending on what market he's trading, he may be faster to take out some of his position, not all, but just small chunks just to stay in there, and then you know he would scale in and scaling scale out that way depending on the market he is, and he would be much faster in doing that in very rotational, in very sort of skippy markets, especially when they're more illiquid, uh, you know, like S&P and so on. But you do that more mechanically in the bonds where instead of, you know, spraying your uh, limits, you just do it, you know, much, much tighter. And that's just, that's just a product of knowing your markets. And should you scale in, scale out? Again, it depends on the kind of trades you're taking. But I guarantee you that in all but one, uh, I think in every single kind of strategy you take, everything from scalping, swing trading, news, con whatever, I think in everything except for maybe a few, very, very few nuanced scalp trades, you should be thinking very carefully, how can I get more size when it's in my favor and very, very, very little size when it's against you? Because it's kind of like just touching hot stoves. Okay, you just, you never know which trade is going to blow you up and you just never know and when I mean blow you up is the kind of trade where um, you have that sort of that, you know, the, the perfect catalyst where you're so married to your trade, you love the trade, and you're going offside and you're like, no, no, I love this trade. I'm going to keep adding into it. I'm going to keep adding into it. You know, it's so good for so many reasons. But this is the thing, no matter how you love the trade, if it's against you, the market's telling you something. OK, the market is telling you that it's going against you. That is key information, so you sh and, and that is when we bring in risk management. And you just have to assume, no matter how amazing the trade is, the fact that it's going against you is telling you something. And for pure survival, you have to assume uh, is doing that for a reason you'll just never understand. And you have to you know, start cutting and scaling out of your trade as fast as possible to be light as light on your feet when it's against you. Okay. And what I would say, guys, another thing to this, for those who may be like super scalpers and you're taking like ridiculously you know, fine takes out of a market, cool. What I would say then is understanding, instead of saying, you know, you ha let's say you have your portfolio of trades and you take many, you know, a few scalps here and there, and you say, cool, but, you know, I, I trade maybe, you know, some people might say, I trade like tick for tick, like I take one tick uh, stop, one tick profit, two ticks profit, one tick stop, doesn't matter, like a very, a very tight portfolio of, you know, and a higher win-loss ratio. But what I would say, instead of then scaling in, is just filtering through your trades and understanding which gives you that that much more conviction that you just instantly, without even scaling into it, you just instantly double or triple your size on it. Okay, and that's the crux. Okay, because again, and this is where your experience and your, your learning as a trader is very, very important in understanding that this is this is the kind of the trade I'm, I see now today that is the cream of the crop. You know, you don't see that, that everything is so set up perfectly and uh, you know you gotta put more side that is more for the scalping side because it's it, i appreciate it is much harder to sort of scale into those kind of trades but that's not kind of an excuse i would accept a lot of the time that there is always some kind of way but you have to be very nuanced and very discretionary to how you do that and then you analyze okay which trades are really you know a lot of the time not so good and then you might be thinking okay well i'll still try them but i'll do them on less size but then that that brings us to the next question is if they're not that good, then why are you even doing them in the first place? So maybe you should just say, you know, uh, I've got like, uh, you know, this trade, this trade, this trade, this trade, and maybe only, you know, uh, one of them is really, really good. Then you might just say, why not just wait for that one instead of just wasting your time, money and effort trading those ones. But again, that's just more of, um, uh, you know, I would make that choice. Uh, you know, whether you guys want to make that choice, it's, it's up to you. But um, anyway. Let's uh, let's quickly go through the question, guys, because I see a lot of questions popping up through. And let me just keep an eye on the clock. Okay, going an hour in, perfect. So let's just, uh, if you guys want to send in a few of your questions, I'll, I'll I'll scroll up and I'll see some of your some of your stuff. So, um, let's see, Big Toasty, how's it going? Uh, another familiar name. Uh, I just want to keep some of the questions more more um, specific to you know to the topic of the stream. Uh, okay, so uh, Deca, I see a question here about how do you distance uh, scaling in, buying more. 
uh, uh, distance because of risk? Okay, that's a very, very good question and actually something I'll tie in just now. So let me just quickly, I'll come back to you, Deca, on that question of, of, of distance to target or whatever and, and, and basing your risk. That's very good. I'll, um, I'll come right back to it. That will lead me into the next section quickly. Um, Alfred, yeah, you just slap it on sometimes. You got to get in there when you're right. Yep, that's it. And Alfred, one, one thing I'll mention as well about getting in while you're right, uh, right is... Um, let's just erase some of this some of this stuff here. One big thing as well, like we're very big on this as well, like in terms of treating trading as a skill and understanding you know, the price ladder as a skill. So again, we, we focus this on the course. Is the fact that one interesting thing you'll notice about new people on the course when they join the Axia career program is either they're very scrappy and they get involved a billion times in, 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 in the ladder or they're so, so hesitant to touch the ladder, which is great. But there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity, learning opportunity that is left on the table by just not getting involved. And I feel like this is why some some people, when you ever, whenever you see the question of, hey, uh, when you do risk reward, and this will tie into the risk risk reward section, uh, risk control, is hey, do you uh, do you just do one percent of your account and say, hey, my stops there? Okay, what's one percent? Okay, it's this. I'm gonna allocate it this many um, clips, uh, th th this much, you know, uh, I don't know, two hundred dollars or whatever you can afford, and then my target's here. So you have a very stationary uh, stop target or whatever. Uh, you know, and you, you, you get that kind of question. And, and I feel those people who are perhaps thinking along those lines, I would argue from my personal perspective, and, and I see this so much, is that I feel that is too much of a one-dimensional approach you have with a lot of new traders. And why is this? It's because to go from being a one-dimensional trader to being multi-dimensional, where you can pull in different information from different sources to making up to, to, to weigh the probabilities of how things are moving, knowing when it gets good to really size up, it takes experience and debriefing and learning, but it just comes through practice. And this is why on the course, we spend, you know, we go through drills where we literally go through price ladder drills. I think one day of the course is dedicated to just having guys on, on the price ladder. So we literally, I think some of them are, um, I, I think you have to choose a position at random and then, uh, you know, you have to manage that trade. Like you have to be in the market and you have to manage the trade. And it's it's, it's all about learning position sizing as your on-site and off-site. Another one I think is, uh, an another one is like, you have to lose as much as possible, uh, which is actually really funny, a uh, reverse psychology uh, one. But, uh, or like, um, you know, you flip a coin and then you, you get in and out. And, and it's basically promoting people to just get involved, get in there and, and, and intuitively understand how to manage risk as much as possible, okay? And the, and the big driving force we're trying to funnel people into is understanding that when it's when you're right, you really, really have to make hay. Well, you really just have to go through. You have to go for the jugular. You have to be a pig. You have to be greedy and just really, really push. And that's one the reason we're trying to, we are trying to make mold and emulate people on that is because that's a lot of the senior guys. They do that so fantastically. No matter what product they trade, no matter how they trade, no matter what it is, you know, they, they could, um, you know, some guys might be, um, you know, they might be, uh, you know, taking hits, they're taking one, they're taking two, three, four, five, six. But, you know, when they're taking those hits, they're doing those on, you know, very small size, tiny clips. And then when the big trade comes, they do that on nearly full size. And it makes all of this literally irrelevant. And, you know, or other guys might just be waiting for, you know, for this as much as possible. And then, you know, really, really push. So they go for the jugular, they really, you know, go for it. But that's a product of experience of debriefing and, you know, deeply digesting what your, um, you know, of your profession. And um, let me just go. So that's just going on what Alfred said earlier. The, uh, okay, so. So Chris, uh, glad I'm discussing this. Have you been, have you ever been stuck offside? I was in way too large, took too much heat and that should have happened to me on Friday during the trade. Oh, Chris, I do remember you asking this in the sense of, um, I, I think you meant, might have meant this psychologically. Um, no, it's actually even more dumb. Uh, I was even more dumb than, than that, Chris, because I legitimized, I, I legitimized the reason of getting stuck into trades. So I was, I wasn't even as, as, as smart as recognizing, Hey, I shouldn't get stuck in these kind of trades where I'm going massively offside. It wasn't like, oh yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm doing something bad here. I was legitimi legitimizing those kind of trades to myself, 
as as a crutch to say, hey, you know, I'm going offside. That's that's good. But you know, I'm, I'm really understanding this trade. That I'm going to commit, and that's to sort of make make do with me being, you know, in my early days, not being comfortable understanding the nuance of should I be in this trade or not, and if I am offside again, just you know, taking scaling down the uh, the size and so on. And uh, it's it's easy to bury bury yourself in the hole if you're very if you're very um, comfortable with being offside. But I, 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 the thing I'm trying to get you is you should be extremely comf uncomfortable being offside and extremely comfortable adding in as much as possible while you're on side. So you're basically flipping the logic. And I feel like people people when they first start trading, they're more like that. They they're, they're more comfortable getting stuck in a trade. And going off site, and and they're scared adding to their trade as they go on site. But you you literally have to reverse, reverse the uh, re reverse it. Um. So Chris, I, I might I, I might I mean I don't know where you are with your trading and and everything. So I again I mean it, it's I I feel it's even more you know the same way how a, a doctor will not understand a um a, a patient at all, and you know him recommending some kind of you know crazy surgery or fix. So take this with a pinch of salt because I don't know your trading situation or how you trade, but just as an experiment, just say to yourself, I'm going to try as an experiment. I'm going to be, you're, you're, you being froze, you being stuck in that trade, your determination should be in that trade. Just flip it. Just be extremely intolerant. Should be, uh, it's fine going offside, let's say more ticks, because I think as, as, as Captain uh, Axelrod said, when the volatility picks up, you have to adapt. So it's fine being offside. It's just the fact that when you're offside, you have to be in with as little, 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 little size as possible. One lot, one clip. Uh, you know, let's say, and this is the thing. I want to. You, you guys may be thinking of instead of thinking generically. Here's my stop, and here's my target. Uh, you should be thinking more about like you know, in terms of clips. Like you know, I have ten lots available to me. And that means every clip is two lots, for example. Or I have a hundred lots. Uh, every clip is twenty, and then you decide how much of those. Uh, you know, let's say have five and you decide, do I want to be with one lot or three lots, depending on how, you know, how the situation changes and so on. And this is why it brings back to me where my little rant. This is my little rant um, uh, to those who may have, you know, may say, oh, I'll have a, a fixed stop here. That'll be 2% of my account. And I have a target here and I'm just going to stop. And that's what I'm going to do. Again, bringing back the blog, my own my own blog, which I just plugged to you guys, but I'm gonna do it because I I, I you know I wouldn't be writing it if I didn't consider it really important. Um, yeah, when you're dealing with a, a, a an organism that is that is complex, and everyone will, uh, yes, offside means against your trade, and anyone involved in any co complex domain, um, wartime, flying a plane, um, I'm sure there's gonna be a few pilots here. Uh, they usually make they usually make very good traders. Uh, anytime you, or, or sailors or whatever, expecting this kind of you know you, you, you saying this this kind of like stop and target and I'm just gonna sit there and that's it. You you expect the ride to be so smooth from here to here or so binary. There's this binariness which I just don't feel exists in trading. Trading is such is this complex organism that is just alive and breathing and so on and that you just never know how things ch change in your trade. And this is, again, the senior guys do this so well. One guy might be like, okay, I've got a standard trade here. You know, he's going for a certain type of play. Let's say, you know, he's got his market profile. Uh, he's going for like a liquidation play. Okay. Uh, there's like a ledge here. And there's like a liquidation play in the burn. He's shorting it. Okay. He, let's say he's in with two clips. And then what happens? You get some crazy risk on. What happens? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, let's say it's November. And the vaccines come out. Really, really good news, right? It means everyone's going to buy equities and sell the bonds. Okay. Uh, so they're buying equities, selling the bonds for the vaccine. And let's say the, you're in a trade already, and uh, the bonds um, and the bonds absolutely collapse. Okay. And you have this great price, this great fill. What are you going to do? You have two clips. Are you going to say, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm going to stick to my target here, and uh, I'm just going to wait for it"? No, because everything has happened. All of a sudden, everything has shifted. Like everything has changed, and, and and you know now you've got to go for the jugular. You've got to go for it because you know you've uh, the probabilities have shifted. Everything has changed in that trade. Again, complexity. We the the nature of the beast has changed, and now you've got to put on you know max size and then really really go for it, extend your target and so on. So this is where you become multi-dimensional and multi-adaptive in approaching your trading and 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 evolving away from 
Okay, okay, I think my pen is going crazy now. Okay, evolve going away from, uh, you know, this here to this. This may seem scary and one thing I, I struggled with, but again, if you guys struggle with that, try different price ladder drills that we have, you know, some of our uh, price ladder courses on the website uh, or, or various things. Just, you know, obviously do it on some kind of simulation. Don't do it with, with life. Uh, but just 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 don't be scared. Just get in there and just understand. Just be really, really good at managing your risk uh, on site, off site, and just being very um just finding it very intuitive to do all this is what I'm trying to explain. Okay, so uh, sorry guys, I think I jumped through some of the questions. How are we doing for time? Okay. Uh yeah. Sorry, guys, just, uh, just really, really going through them. Do you practice? So, James, do you practice order flow execution? Maybe practice going off size almost to the point of desensitizing yourself to closing the trade uh, quickly. Yeah, so I mean, kind of touched upon like just doing a lot of trade drills. Like, I don't know, here's one uh, just getting randomly at market. Yeah, obviously, don't do it on your live account, but just get in and just see how you can manage that trade. And just understand intuitively from the things you just utilize what you know you know now or things perhaps some of our viewers have done at some of our courses using it all from there and just get involved just just be so intuitive and just having the rule of understanding tell yourself now now that you guys understand adverse selection right the reason you're offside there's probably a good reason and the reason you're on site there's probably a good reason so just play around with the idea and see how that affects like these kind of trading drills and and, and playing around with that uh, so to, from my experience, James, um, do I practice maybe going offside? Well, I just practice of just live trading in the end for me and and banging my head against the wall of two, like two billion times until I finally realized, oh, by the way, by the way, uh, if you're on side, you should probably add. If you're offside, probably not a good idea to keep adding. Uh, again, for outright futures trading for different markets, not futures or cash or whatever. I mean, it's it's. It's moving away and it's you have more nuanced situations but that's that's going away from the purpose of how we trade at axia and the streams and everything so anyway um andrew uh spoofing on the price ladder uh, i'd like to do obviously a more bit of a question on that but you know algorithms or spoofing or this kind of thing on the order book um i don't think it's more difficult it's just you have to understand that with spoofing and algorithms you just have a different participant and um, understanding the fact like you have a new participant, you just have to learn all about your participant. When does he trade? When does he not trade? How, how does he move? What does he do? It's just learning. It's just you have another. Um, yeah, it's just another part. You just got to learn all about him, understand him and how to play around him. Because, you know, um, spoofing, whether it's done uh, algorithmically or uh, by human or just extending the argument to 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 uh, algorithms. Again, you just they're built by humans. They're doesn't matter what the participant is they'll ha they'll leave a trail of activity they'll they'll consistently do the same thing Th they'll produce mark market generated information like the profile like in footprint you know if you're a market participant you have to leave a trail behind you and if you leave a trail you can trade off that trail you just got to figure out how to do it okay um Ah, okay, great question, guys. Uh, really, really good. You guys reminded me. Perfect. So, so using hard stops. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so Smoker and Chris. Uh, should I use automated stop orders? I mean, uh, well, actually, there's another question about um, John B. Do I have a hard stop? Yes, John B. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, really good question. All like all in one go. So perfect. You asked me that. So I'll tell you my experience right now. Personally, for me, um, I treat my I'm, I treat my trading day kind of like adverse selection again in and by itself. If you're losing constantly and 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 your PNL curve literally looks like this, should be a bit more nuanced. I don't want you guys to say, "Hey, you know, you told me to always look at my PNL," and you guys start trading your PNL. But if this is zero, and your PNL literally is like this all day, okay. And again, assuming you're trading with edge, you're not doing anything crazy, you're not doing anything mental, you, you're trading in the right market environment, whatever, then you just have to assume that the reason your PL is is this is for a good reason. Okay. Market shifted, you don't understand why. You're not in your element. X, Y, and Z. Okay. And and and, and here is the merit why having a tight stop for the day, a, a, a risk stop allocation for the day, no matter what it is, 
uh, there's merit to it because again, if, if you keep doing this, there's probably a good reason and it's also likely you'll just keep going, at least in my experience. And uh, I don't know if I don't know if he's watching, but um, for, for a long time, I, I also had a very big problem where it doesn't matter what my stop was, if my st stop was five hundred dollars, if my stop was one thousand, if my stop was two thousand, guess what I'll do? I'll literally keep trading until I hit it. Okay, because you think okay you have space whatever, but you just you keep trading it as you hit it, and then I realized to myself wait. Adverse selection, just like in each trade, is the same for the way the day plays out. If I keep going in this mode where I just, I'm obviously, you know, I'm not in my element, I have no idea, I'm, I'm not in sync, I'm X, Y, and Z. So there's no reason to just keep letting it go, like, you know, here or here. Just cut it early and just assume that it's that, you, you know, your p is down for, the, for a reason. And other days, you know, everyone's traded those days where, you know, the market's trading perfectly as per your, as per your strategy. And you literally just go like, you know, perhaps like this or whatever. And you, you can do no wrong. Okay. And again, this is where you bring in the, 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 the logic. If you understand the first principles, if you're going offside for a reason, let's say in your PL for the day, there's a good reason. This is why it makes sense to have a tight uh, PL stop for the day. And this is literally, I, I just halved my PL I'm allowed for the day to trade, and it changed a lot of my trading. It suddenly was so easy, so much easier to just be in profit for the day or for the week. Because my losing days were suddenly way sh smaller, just by literally halving it, and it didn't seem to really, you know, like it just stopped me from just trading, you know, badly, and um, um, and 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 you know, the days that were good, you just you just keep on pressing, you keep on trading, and automatically days where you know perhaps you may have like a bit of this or whatever, you get you get small chunks. These days stack up very quickly and pay very quickly for these kind of days. And again, this is what I mean. If you guys understand, uh the just the very basics of add verse trying to be cool here trying to write it okay adv selection okay that that should all just make sense to you so yes uh and and, and i would say especially when while you're new and you, you're, you're coming into live live trading let's say you've you traded live traded live for a while you should really be thinking about how can i just not get destroyed on these kind of days the easiest way is just to you know uh, you know put some kind of hard stop and then really, really, really try and push as much as possible. I, I, that's, this is why, again, I don't like having a target for the day, unless, let's say, you know, let's say this, let's say you hit the ridiculous trade and you got lucky because there was ridiculous news, like there was insane volatility in news. And then, you know, let's say on one day you make, on average days you make, I don't know, uh, 1,000, and uh, and then you're up suddenly 7,000 because there's something crazy that went on. I mean, you know, just just take your damn money and, and be done with it. Don't, don't mess that up because that will be very rare. But with, without these ridiculous exception days, okay, um, I don't really like having that hard uh, target just because, again, if you're trading really well, you want to push that as much as you can. And there's probably a good reason because the market, you're in your element, okay. Um, and uh, Chris, for hard stops. So this is one thing uh, for you guys trading S&P. Really, please don't do this on your live account. And, and I, if you have, you know, if you guys are consistent trading and whatever, I do not want to tinker with how you guys want to do it. But for those who want to experiment, for those guys who want to have drills or, or understanding things, um, you should, um, I would say this, don't have hard stops per se, have emergency stops, like crazy stops where you'll just get out, but make them wide. But be, while you're offside, try and be offside with as little size as possible that even if you're off, even if the market's so, uh, okay, I'm using my thing. Even if you're offside, like ridiculous amounts, that that doesn't really hurt you. Like it, it, you can you can keep going and going and going. Okay, because you're 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 offside and you're offside with such like little. I don't know. Let's say one clip, or half a clip. Let's just say you're offside with half a clip, and you, you can keep you know. And for, for a very rotational market like Spoo, that will make sense. And then you know when you're on side, you say, hey, I'm going to bring it up to a clip, two clips, three, whatever, and keep on going. Granted, I agree. That if you have a tiny account, it's very, very hard to do that because you're physically trading one lot, two lots, three lots. It is, and that's truly it is harder. Like that's just how it is. Which is why either you want to be trading the micros, or uh, you know perhaps uh, unfortunately it is a, it is a matter of account size, and you know perhaps there's you know funding trial funding or something like that you could look into. But uh, yeah, that that's just the nature of the game in that sense. 
Okay, so how are we doing? Okay, so um, I believe if I pull up my so a bit of a so again, I kind of talked about that kind of risk control uh, scaling in and out of trade. So hopefully I've done that question justice. If there's one word. Adverse, I think I just misspelled it. Selection, okay, obviously can't spell again on stream. Adverse, no, okay. If there's one word, literally, adverse selection, remember it, and I'll explain literally everything in terms of scaling in and out to trace understanding and so on. <clears throat> um, Sid, do actually senior guys, uh, senior members, senior guys, senior members uh, stop trading? If they have a huge profit in the first 10 or 15, uh, 15 or 20 minutes of the market open, how do they manage the situation? Do they completely stop trading or do they keep going? Um, very good question, actually. Uh, I really keep going. Like, uh, I don't know, I haven't really spoken to them that specific, but just from experience of how they take, like, again, when they really push, they literally go, they pull out all the stops and just you keep pushing and pushing, pushing. It's this like pit bull relentless like you know if 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 everything is going for you they just keep pushing and pushing i agree at one point it may get detrimental or whatever but that's just in your element with your understanding to understand the early warning signs of when you're pushing is you know disadvantageous but that that comes much later than you would think okay i say for the senior guys no just because that, that's how they want to do and don't forget the senior guys have different um priorities than as a new trader and I'm not sure if he's watching today, uh, but it's someone who told me in the first summer I was here at Axio that when you're a new trader, okay, philosophically you understand statistics. Like, you know, you know a trade has whatever, 80, let's just make it up, 80% chance and you understand the expected value and, you know, from a statistics point of view, X, Y, and Z, you should do the right thing. But one thing that actually is, a, one thing where we move away from the statistics and just learning from the senior guy is just street fighting experience where he'll tell you, who cares about that? Just throw it out the window, nearly all of it. Because when you're as you new, when you are a new trader, it's just so easy to just get destroyed by so many things. And Sid, like if you're in that position, you know, as a new trader, you have a small account and you're trying to build and grow an account, and you and you're in a huge profit. It's so your edge is so tiny, so fractional. As a new trader, you always remember, always assume your edge is much smaller than what it is, and your nuance for edge is so tiny. Do not overestimate your trade, your edge. You should always assume that your edge is actually a lot smaller and a lot more fragile than what you think it is. Okay. Uh, alias, what hours do your senior tra traders trade? Uh, all the hours. Uh, well, a lot. Of, it depends how busy it is, but I mean, when it gets busy, like you know, especially like election night, we were here like 24 hours, or you know, trading 24 hours or whatever. That's the extreme. Um, depends on the, how the volatile the market is. It's literally just trading the opportunity that's there. If, if the market's hot and there's so many things, we'll be doing extended hours, I don't know, 7 a.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Depends what's going on, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, events. It, it, it depends a lot. Um, and to be honest, you know, one thing I've uh, seen on the floor, a lot of the, you know, Alex and other other guys, uh, you know, who are mentoring, they'll tell you, you know, if the senior guys are doing that, then you as a junior trader should be doing exactly the same thing. Like, you know, you should be doing, you should double down and do even more than them to, you know, to, to, um, very easy question. Order flow newbie, price ladder or footprint charts? Price ladder first. Always learn price ladder first. Footprint is your best complement to the price ladder, 100%. But, uh, understanding the, um, if you intuitively, again, <laughs> the, it feels like I'm, I'm going to show you this again, but I kind of talk about it in here. Do you really know price ladder mechanics? And I'll tell you why I bring this up, uh, guys. Because there's a few people, uh, there's a lot of new guys who come in. And um, literally this, if you read this, there's too many people who come in and, you know, they say they're order flow traders or the price ladder traders. But when you, when they start using footprint charts, it, it really tests to know your fundamental mechanics on the price ladder. And it's, obvious that by not understanding the footprint that they actually don't understand the price ladder okay but when people use the footprint first and don't get the price ladder it just it will never make sense to you but if you if you know your 
price ladder inside out. You know the mechanics. You know how people. You know the 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 auction process, the market auction theory, and everything. Transplanting your knowledge from, uh, you know, the price ladder to the footprint is really really easy. You can make that transition very quickly, and this is why you know when the when the footprint became a big thing, a lot of guys at Axia because we're we're super super price ladder based. Uh, it was really easy for them to adopt and it made 100% sense why we use it. And this is why it's become such a big thing in our toolkit using the footprint, um, you know, at Axia and everything because it lends itself nicely and, and they complement each other, okay? So they're joined at the hip. Then you can't replace the footprint with the price ladder, but at the same time, you lose a lot of, you lose a lot of uh, the information you walk forwards from the price ladder to the footprint is lost, okay? If you don't use, um, if you don't look at the price ladder at all. So 100%, um, Steve, use price ladder, learn price ladder first, and then you should make that transition that much easier into the, uh, the the footprint. Would you recommend new traders to spend more time learning economic news affecting the market rather than getting lost in, in learning order flow tools? Yes, I would. Again, just because I'm telling you now doesn't mean you should go crazy and you know and 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 looking at like academic, like super crazy formulas for macro, whatever, you should be aware. Yes. In fact, you should just be aware of like, you know, basic macroeconomic principles. Cool. Learn, look a lot at the data of how we released, understand why it affects different asset classes. And then just watch, just pure observation, just watch how the markets react to them all the time. And this is kind of going to the beginning of my stream where order flow will be so much easier to understand under the context of different market themes. So a lot of the time, the theme might be that we're repricing an, an economic data release and all order flow will make sense to you from like, you know, risk on off flow, hawkish dovish flow, uh, X, Y, and Z flow. So, uh, yeah, in that case, do you, uh, daily debrief, do you ever replay the price ladder of several markets at the same time? Yeah. So when I first started learning price ladder and a lot of guys do this, uh, we, we, um, we look a lot at replays hundred percent, uh, for me, because I've, I've moved more away from that. I kind of like do it now on specific things. I'm trying to catalog like, specific kind of flow like oh i've never seen that kind of flow. that's very interesting okay i'm gonna lock that and i'm gonna look at it later so it's being a bit more methodical it's kind of like evolving your debriefing and your learning process um <clears throat> so okay deca i see your question again sorry I, I i said i'll get you it so is there a good point when you would add your position after market moves some points from your entry okay so very briefly and Perfect. Thank you for tying me in. So guys, for those questions, for those of you, I think Chris, I'm not sure if it's the same Chris, I think it was the same Chris and Fabiano. Uh, you hear the word auction a lot, but what does auction mean in trading? And he means in the context of market auction theory, are the clues in the auction and concept of market profile, it basically being the same thing. Again, this will be in the next stream, but I want to, I want to breach the topic where I feel like instead of me hammering away, uh, Deca for me hammering away for, um, you know, every single instance of this situation, you should just understand, you know, if you if you really come to terms with adverse selection, so we discussed that and the market, the auction, as in, uh, you know, let's say the market auction, where we have uh, some we're auctioning a Ferrari for $100, everyone is going to raise their hand in a physical real life auction, they're all going to go bid, and then we bid. And then we go crazy, we go crazy until we start reaching like, you know, high, you know, let's say we reach 10k, uh, everyone's going to want a Ferrari for 10k. We keep going, uh, you know, until we really reach a point where people will start tapering off because the price just is too high for the, you know, for the Ferrari. And then, uh, you know, and then we start tapering off. So if you understand that, you know, the way, the way, um, the market auction theory and all that, and, you know, sellers also doing their own thing when they come in, when it's too expensive, they'll come in and do their own thing or whatever then yes, if you understand where you are within the market auction process and you understand the fact that, okay, the market is kind of balanced and the market agrees that we're now fairly valued at 100 and then some something changes, the market state changes to take us down to like 50, um, then while we are getting close to that price, yes, you will be kind of like, you have to be a bit more tactical in how you approach this. Some guys might be like, okay, I'm going to do a lot of size here and then scale out and that's it. Some guys uh will be like okay i'm gonna scale in as much as i can uh get in um you know scale out scale out and then while we're in the trade this is more about again being multi-dimensional and understanding complexity that it will change you might halfway through while we're auctioning down here something might change you might see 
uh, the order flow shifting in your favor. You might see a footprint pattern shifting in your favor. And uh, then, then you say, hey, look, my average price is still up here. I've scaled some out. But then, you know, if I add in again all of this size here, my average price will be still be here. That's still great. And then you, you re-add, you reload, and then you get in. So it's understanding how we shift. It. So it's kind of like, it, it depends a lot on what happens from A to B if that makes sense. Naturally, you will scale out because just generally as the as the auction, you know, if, if you understand market auction, you'll know that eventually we do taper off. Uh, there is some, you know, there is too much, uh, too cheap of a price and too high of a price intraday when you're trading. So it is a good, you know, it is a good idea to scale out, but you want to commit to that price because you're on side as much, as much, as much as possible for as long as time as possible. So then you're using your executions tactics, the price side of the footprint to do that. Okay. Um, uh, do you recommend going back in time, let's say a year, start journaling? Uh, yes, I would say that. So, um, yes, I would do that, but only from like a more zoomed out approach. Uh, understand what the macro was like, understand what the kind of the themes were like, and see how the markets reacted. Just because you still, unfortunately, this is the thing, it, it, doing it in real time will never be as good as going back. It is very valuable going back, but it is more valuable of just understanding, you know, the, the bigger picture of how the markets moved and shifted. And then as you get closer to the time you're trading, then be a bit more detailed, look at, you know, footprint and loads of other stuff. And then from then on, just keep a walk forward journal, like just from now on, just keep logging, logging, logging. Um, all the little nuances that go on through the day that will just forever be lost if you don't log them. If you find this video interesting, if you want to go deep into the Axia training method and how a trading team of seven figure traders develop setups and strategies and how they learn to build the most profitable trades across all market environments, then join me in this workshop. Now in this workshop, you're going to learn three powerful steps we use to train all our traders on both our London and our Poland trading desks to help build incredible levels of consistency. How to predictably understand which setups work and which don't. You're going to learn our two main strategies for how we perfect our trade timing before we enter every single trade. You're going to learn the VEL concept, which is our one and only technique we use to leverage our largest trades. You'll also learn how to avoid trading setups that don't work, how to avoid those large losses, and our main method we use to identify them that saves our traders significant amounts of capital. Finally, you will learn how our traders use the power of network learning to find market patterns quicker than ever before, so you shortcut that learning curve. In the workshop, we want to program your awareness of elite performance, to program your ability to choose the right setups, and program your ability to be a consistent trader. So the trades that you execute become more simple and clearer. And I can tell you this, you'll never see the markets the same again. You'll never look at the markets with a narrow view of getting lost in all the noise and confusion. You'll take your first step towards a deep edge market awareness. I cannot wait for you to join me in this workshop. And I think you're in for a massive paradigm shift in your understanding of how to develop as a trader. So join me by clicking on the top right hand corner of the screen and sign up for this powerful training workshop or visit EliteTraderWorkshop.com.